I'm going to preach down here this morning. Change things up just a little bit. And just FYI, at the end of this lesson, it's a short lesson because it's the second Sunday, so we've got our group meetings at 930. I'm going to end this lesson singing Ancient Words 275. So if you want to mark your songbook, it's not an invitation song, uh, but 275 is a song I picked this morning to go along with this short lesson that I will be doing. I got some feedback recently. Uh, a couple weeks ago, I ended a lesson with a song, and several people told me that they really liked it, just to mix it up every now and then, and sometimes end with a prayer, sometimes end with a song. So uh, just be prepared for 275 ancient words. We're going to sing that at the end of this lesson. Uh, also, the iPad's not working this morning, so that's why I'm down here, so I can make sure I see the monitor a little bit better. You know, his 40-year-old eyes are having a harder time lately. So go ahead and go to the title slide. We're going to take a look at a passage this morning from 2 Timothy. So if you want to have your Bibles open to 2 Timothy chapter 4, that's going to be our main passage for the day, 2 Timothy chapter 4. And I especially want to focus on one element of this passage, but I'll go ahead and read the whole passage before we get to the next slide. Uh, so 2 Timothy chapter 4, let's start in verse 1 and we'll go through verse 5. Follow along with me if you will. I'm in New American Standard this morning. I solemnly charge you in the presence of God and of Christ Jesus, who is to judge the living and the dead, and by his appearing and his kingdom, preach the word, be ready in season and out of season, reprove, rebuke, exhort with great patience and instruction. For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but wanting to have their ears tickled, they will accumulate for themselves teachers in accordance to their own desires and will turn away their ears from the truth and will turn aside to myths. But you be sober in all things, endure hardship, do the work of an evangelist and fulfill your ministry. <clears throat> So Preston and I were talking the other day, as we often do, and Preston's one of those guys, he's, he's really, really smart. He's a lot smarter than I am, and that's the truth. He's shaking his head. He, he gives off that Florida bumpkin vibe, but that's, that's, an, that's an act. He's very smart. Sometimes, though, we can, we can all be too smart for our own good. And he loves to preach, and he, he's very excited about his future as a preacher. And he's only going to be with us for six more months. So if you haven't had a chance to get to know him or take him out and buy him food, he'll eat, he'll eat his fair share. But he has a, we, sometimes we sit down for a Bible study together and he has these like big picture questions about the future and the church and preaching and, you know, just like preaching as a vocation, like these huge big picture things. And those are great questions to be asking and we should occupy ourselves with big picture stuff too. But I opened up just the other day, I opened up to 2 Timothy 4 and I said, but let's read this passage together and look at how simple this is. Preach the word. Just be prepared to preach the word. And do the work of an evangelist. And fulfill your ministry. And sometimes the way that we accomplish the big picture stuff, the, you know, the future of the church kind of stuff, is just what we're doing right now. Just what we're doing today. You know, just you got to put your nose down. Get in the grind and just do the work. And it's, that, it's the little things that we do day to day as Christians, as preachers, as servants of God. And, and as a church, it's the little things that we do day by day that lead to the big picture stuff being answered. And I think just like whenever you get worried about the future, just read 2 Timothy 4 and remind yourself, just do the work. Just hunker down and do the work that you need to do today. Go and go to the next slide. There's one uh, phrase in particular that I want to focus on. And I want to look at the idea of the word this morning. And 2 Timothy chapter 4 is going to be a passage that we look at a lot this year for a reason that I, I won't give away just yet. That's, that's, that's Andy's job to give it away. But, you know, hint, hint, wink, wink. We might be looking at 2 Timothy 4 quite a bit this year for reasons unexplained. 
And there's a lot of things about this passage that we're going to take a look at. But quite frankly, you have to start with the Word. Because before you do anything else, and you got to know what you're preaching on, and how we're going to go about all this, and personal evangelism, and what in the world does that involve? Well, let's just keep things simple and say, let's first ask, what is the Word? And I want to look at that this morning, and just kind of consider, like, what does it mean to preach the Word? Does the Word still matter today? Is the Word still relevant today? What is involved and what is included in preaching the Word? And it, it, it's kind of a complicated topic, but really, Paul speaks it as if it's not that complicated. Preach the Word. And for Paul, that's just face value. Well, what does that mean? Preach the Word. Well, yeah, but what if... No, let's go preach the Word. And it's a pretty simple set of directions here. Preach the word. And go to the next bullet point before we move on to this, uh, this third slide. This is, of course, in contrast to what other people were preaching. And as he explains in those next couple verses, that there are some people who don't want to preach the word anymore. They're not as interested in preaching the word. They don't want to do the work of an evangelist. They don't want to fulfill their ministry that God has given them. Instead... The word is in contrast to what he explains in verses 3 and 4. That there are people who don't want to endure sound doctrine. They want to have their ears tickled. They want to accumulate teachers in accordance to their own desires. They want to turn away their ears from the truth. And they want to turn instead to myths. And on the next screen, there's a list of bullet points of I think what might be included in that. So go ahead and go there. <clears throat> what does it mean to kind of do verses 3 and 4? Because before we get to preaching the word, I think it's important to establish what Paul is establishing here, which is there, there are a lot of things out there that aren't the word. And so just preaching by itself is not what we're supposed to be doing. We're supposed to be preaching the word. And you go to YouTube or you can watch like late night religious programming. Like, you know, you go and turn on TBN at three o'clock in the morning or something like that. And you can hear a lot of preaching that is not preaching the word. And we have to have discernment to know what is preaching the word versus having our ears tickled and not enduring sound doctrine and paying attention to myths. So uh, here's some things that you, that you can think about. Like if, if this is happening, it's probably not preaching the word. That's kind of what this screen is. is if, if this is what you're hearing, you're probably not hearing the word. So I think included in that would be preaching that doesn't represent some element of God's character accurately. Or that denies something about God, like the deity of Jesus. If you are hearing preaching that brings God down to our level, rather than elevate us up to God's level, it's probably not preaching the word. If you're hearing some, some preaching and it is minimizing or trivializing Jesus in some way. And you will encounter that, by the way. Like for us, we take it for granted that Jesus is the Son of God. He's co-equal, that He's a part of the Trinity. And we regard Him as deity dwelling in bodily form. Like we take that for granted. But when you engage with your friends out there in the world, co-workers and people from other religions, you'll discover very quickly, wait a minute. Not everybody thinks that Jesus is the Son of God. Shocker! I know! But if you're hearing preaching and Jesus is not being put in his place as he properly should be, like Revelation chapter 5 talks about, that worthy is the Lamb. If you're hearing preaching that does not proclaim Jesus as the Son of God and the fullness of deity dwelling in bodily form, you're not listening to the word. Uh, how about preaching that promotes false doctrines and practices, especially when it is motivated by convenience or popularity? Because that's kind of what he's saying in 2 Timothy 4, isn't he? That there are people who don't want to endure sound doctrine. Instead, they just want to have their ears tickled. You know, they, they, just, they want something that sounds good. They want something that fits in with the world. They want something that is convenient, that works on their schedule. Uh, how about preaching that constantly appeals to material or carnal things? 
like career aspirations or the pursuit of wealth or that fosters covetousness and envy with other people's possessions or twists the gospel as if it's all about you. Now, I made the mistake of listening to Joel Osteen's Christmas presentation this last year. I say this last year because it was like last week, but it was last year. And, I, you know, we pick on Joel Osteen, I just, we in general, simply because if you're going to put yourself out there like that and you're going to preach in front of 25,000 people and put it on national TV, like, you know, you made the choice to put yourself on national TV. That was your choice that you made. And so Joel Osteen, I admit, is kind of a, he's kind of easy to pick on. But if you listened to his Christmas presentation, it is so insane how much about you the whole thing is about. And I mean the whole thing. The whole story of the Bible. It was as if God spent 10,000 years just waiting for you to come along. No, just waiting for you to come along. <laughs> But every story in the Bible is about you. The story of Joseph and Mary, it's you. Joseph and Mary is your story. The story of Jesus is all about you. It's your story. And God is working in your life. He is manifesting in your life all of your dreams. And Joel Osteen and others like him, they don't hide it, by the way. They're very blatant. They talk about how you're going to receive that financial blessing, that windfall. You're going to get that career promotion. You're going to get that new job. You're going to sign the papers on that new big house. They don't hide it. It's blatant. And if you're hearing preaching that is always appealing to carnal things, you're not hearing the word. Preaching that dismisses sin or trivializes it. You know, we're not in the judgment business here. And I get that there's an attitude that we need to have where we are open and receptive to all people, to sinners. And that sinners need to know that they can be around Christians and that they will be loved and that they will be supported, but that they will be loved and supported through a process of repentance and change. And if we're preaching a message that says, we're not in the judgment business here, we don't talk about that, we don't judge people for that, you're not hearing the word. Or modern day myths, because he does point out in 2 Timothy 4, that they place the word for myths. That's the word that's used in New American Standard is myths. And there is a lot of mythology in modern day preaching. There's a lot of myths Myths about what the church is. Myths about what it means to be successful or prosperous. Myths about what the word blessed means. I'll tell you what, read Matthew 5 sometime and you'll read a very different definition of the word blessed than the mythology that surrounds the blessed in a lot of modern day preaching. So go ahead and go to the next slide. Because now that we've kind of seen like what the word isn't, we need to look at what the word is because that's our marching orders is preach the word. Got that next slide. I have no control up here. I'm just I'm on this ride just like you are. So what is the word? Uh, the word. Oh, I think we skipped a slide. Go backward one. Yep, that's it. We got it. We got it. Technology is great until it's not. Everyone loves technology until, until it bites you in the ankle. Uh, so what is the word? The word begins with God. Preach the word starts with God. His word is the very emanation of himself into this world. And it is no, it's no mistake or coincidence that that's how John starts his gospel. That in the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God. And then he proceeds to explain how the word became flesh and dwelt among us. That the word was the light of God being shared and shed in this world. The light that he says enlightens every man. And we don't want to get too much into the weeds on the philosophy of all of this. But when John uses the word word in John chapter 1, logos in the Greek, there's actually a, a whole realm of philosophy that's attached to that. Now, there's a lot of Greek philosophy, but I don't think that John was really trying to reach into the, the Greek toolbox 
when he's talking about the Logos in John 1. There's a lot of Jewish philosophy that's attached to the Logos as well. And I think he's more reaching into the Jewish toolbox there when he talks about the Logos. Essentially what Logos means, what the Word means that Jesus was the Word. When you think about your words coming out of your mouth, those words are not just sound waves riding through the air. Those words are not just the hot breath of a person coming out of their mouth. Those words are not just unintelligible noises like dogs barking. When I use my words, what am I revealing to you? I'm revealing my thoughts, my will, my intentions. I'm telling you who I am. How do you know anything about me except for my appearance, but for what I say to you? When I say what my name is, when I say what my history is, when I say what my thoughts and my opinions and my will and my desires are, that's how you know who I am. Jesus is the very expression of God himself in this world. So when it says that he is the word, it's the extension of God to mankind. So that like it says in Matthew's gospel, when Jesus is called Emmanuel, God with us, it's really God with us. God speaking to us through the man, Jesus Christ, who is both fully God and also fully human at the same time. And if that boggles the mind, that's okay. I, th I think it's kind of supposed to boggle the mind a little bit. But the word also has intelligible meaning. When we preach the word, we're supposed to preach something with substance to it. The fact that God expresses himself through word and not something unintelligible or something that's beyond our understanding, I think is very telling. God wants us to know him. God wants us to know his will, his commandments, his desires, and his feelings also. That God is a feeling God. When we hear God's word, his word illuminates us. Like Psalm 119 says, that thy word is a lamp to my feet. It lights my path. And like John chapter 1 says that Jesus came into this world to enlighten, to illuminate every person. The word also requires a response that you need to respond to the word. You need to act upon the word like James chapter 1 talks about. Be ye not merely hearers of the word who delude themselves. Rather, be doers of the word. Do something about it. And go to the next slide. This is the final slide here. The word is a powerful tool. And the word is an ally. It's described as, as a weapon. A defensive weapon. The sword of the Spirit, the Word of God. Hebrews chapter 4 talks about the Word. And I think maybe a, a slightly more complicated passage than we give it credit for at face value. And I think that Hebrews 4, by the way, I think there's, there's more depth there than we sometimes think that there is. But it does talk about how the Word is living and active and sharper than a two-edged sword. The Word is effective if it is received with a true and open heart. The word is enough. God reminded his people in Deuteronomy chapter 8. That when I led you through the wilderness all these years. And I fed you with the manna. I deprived you of a lot of worldly things. Of a lot of carnal pleasures. Why? So that you could learn that man does not live by bread alone. But by what? By every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. And the word includes the gospel. The word includes the gospel. The gospel is the message of Jesus Christ. It is good news that Jesus is God incarnate, God in the flesh, who walked on earth and spoke to people and gave us an example, who then suffered and died an ignoble death as a sacrifice for all sins for all time, but was raised from the dead to lead us to life as a forerunner back into the world of light so that we could then follow him in like manner when we believe his message and hear the word, when we confess that belief and resolve to change and to live by his word and his will and to be baptized in the same manner that he was, 
buried in the ground, the dead man, and then raised up in newness of life. And that we might continue to live in his word and that it would be effective in our hearts for the rest of our lives. Let's go ahead and end by singing ancient words after which, immediately afterward, please proceed to your group meetings. And remember, we've got new groups today. So if you don't know where you're supposed to go, 